<clears throat> Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a nice, cozy audience, big room. <laughs> um, how many people know what STEM means? What is STEM? You know what STEM is? Yeah. So STEM is a basic terminology for science, technology, engineering, and maths. That's all the basic terminology. Uh, over the past couple of years, some people have been expanding the term to call it STEAM, which is science, technology, arts, engineering, and maths, make it STEAM. So they're incorporating the arts aspect of it. You know, if you just keep it STEM, it's pretty geeky. Arts kind of add that unique angle to it, makes it a lot more fun. <clears throat> so in that sense, this is STEMing kids, but it's basically been STEAMing kids. Hopefully they're not STEAMing in anger, but STEAMing. <clears throat> now the way um, I, uh, well I, I, my name is Arun Gupta, I run DevOps for Kids. DevOps for Kids is a non-profit founded in the US. Um, so if you have heard of the conference, DevOps is from those people. Uh, I'm part of the program committee over there. I've, this organization was founded in Belgium and I took that whole organization to the US. So I work very closely with the DevOps people in Belgium where it's primarily based and I run the non-profit and 501c3, that means the charitable organization. Um, I run the organization in the US. And our goal is to get kids excited about STEM technology you know, and keep them, hopefully keep them engaged. Um, even though I say kids, but several times parents have come and attended our workshop because they wanted an introduction to technology. So what do we do? Well, we do, <coughs> excuse me, we do lots of hands-on workshops and they range from a variety of topics. Anything from Scratch, to Greenfoot, to BlueJay, to Minecraft modding, to iPhone programming, Arduinos, Lego, Raspberry Pis. So you can see, you know, <coughs> concepts like Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and iPhone programming are very appealing sometimes to adults as well. So we have lots of times where adults have come in. Um, if you look at the number of events, and this is again a very partial list, so DevOps for Kids is truly a worldwide thing, definitely a lot more density in the Europe. I run the US chapter, we have several chapters in the US, but we have had events all over the world, you know, a little bit in Asia, a little bit in South America, but definitely Europe and um, heavily centered in US as well. In terms of teams, uh, we've got lots of teams, you know, DevOps for Kids itself, uh, has several chapters and we partnered with a lot of people to encourage to try these workshops. Lots of countries, this is just a colorful slide. So what do we do? <coughs> Scratch, Scr uh, how many people know what Scratch is? Okay, some of you. So Scratch is a program, uh, it's a, think of it as a browser-based program and you can go to scratch.mit.edu, it is basically by MIT, um, it's a visual 2D programming is a, one of the best and the easiest ways to get a five to six year old get started with programming. Um, very visual, very interactive, very intuitive interface. Um, there are about six million plus projects that are already published on scratch.mit.edu, truly open sourced. Uh, the source code of Scratch is open source, the source code for all of those projects is open source. So you can look at it, how people are building those projects. I'll show you a couple. Uh, the age range, typically what we have seen, and again, I'm gonna keep focusing on kids, uh, but the age range is five to 15. This is, if you're a kid or you know a kid who has never programmed, this could be the first introduction because it, what does it teach? Well, it teaches you lots of concepts. How do you do sequencing, you know? <clears throat> the very first example we do is, the logo for Scratch is a kitty. Now, the moment you fire up Scratch, there's a kitty. So we said the very first exercise is, Make kitty go five steps forward and five steps backward. That's a basic sequencing. You know, how do you repeat a task five times? It's a for loop kind of stuff. Um, how do you do iteration? How do you do variables? How do you? There is two. There are two kitties on the scratch screen. They are talking to each other. If they hit each other, they should bounce back. That's event-driven programming. We don't use that term for kids, but we explain the basic concept to them that hey, by the way. When these two things meet, that means there's an event happening and you want to do something on that. So it really helps you build those basic fundamentals and concepts. <clears throat> this is the Scratch UI. I'm going to skip it. I'm actually going to go to the browser instead. So if I go to scratch.mit.edu. Okay. 
So this is sort of how the interface looks like. Um, you can sign up. Anybody can sign up for Scratch, or you can, once you sign up, then you can sign in. Hopefully I remember my password. I do. Ta -da. Um, so th this is a feature um, studio. Let's say I look at this here, uh, Rio Olympics. Let's say pick one project here. You know, race robot versus human. Um, okay, it's going to take a while to load it, so it's loading the project now. Um, I click on the green flag here, and when I click on the green flag, it's running. So every time you, I think you have to press a different key, maybe. Oh, there you go. So I'm using space to make the robot run and arrow to make the human run. So as I'm pressing, they're interacting. So you're making the game understand the keystroke. Very simple, very intuitive. What do you do with it? Well, you look inside the code. And all that is required to get that working is this code fragment here. You don't have to remember any code. These are all blocks you can drag and drop. They're very nicely divided into motion, looks, sound, pen, data, operator, so on. So you want to do something, events? Yeah, when flag clicked. So this is when flag clicked. So you're changing the costume, you know, because by default, the, the runners were standing straight, changing costume, you want to show them like this, then like this, then like this. Then it's a weird way of running, but you can change, create multiple costumes. So it can really become really a lot of fun very quickly. Let me show one of the games that I work with my son on. This is something I created with my son when he was um, five years, okay? Um, <clears throat> he's a big fan of Despicable Me 2 and Captain America. So he wanted to build a game. You know, we spent one Sunday afternoon. We said, okay, let's build something cool. So let me play this first of all. So we, we spent about two and a half to three hours to build this game. You know, it was completely his imagination. Um, but in that process, in that three hour, I, he had to think logically. As in like, okay, I, because sometimes say, I want this to happen. Okay, how are we gonna translate that into code? Oh, that means when Captain America, well, Captain America is in the middle, with a minion dressed up like Captain America. So now he has to turn. In real life, it's easy to turn. How do you do that in the code? change costume. So translating your thought into code was the first thing he had to understand. Then now imagine there are three you have to place, three minions, purple haired minions. How do you place them? Oh, let's look at the X and Y coordinates. So you're explaining the basic X and Y coordinate for a five year old. Then now <clears throat> he's walking very nicely towards from the center to the back. But then when he is approaching them, he's running fast. So you start explaining, you know, how much delay you want to add between those. So the simple concepts that we take in life for granted, and how do you translate them into code? This is a fantastic very first experience for anywhere five to six year old. I mean, not that he could write this program by himself, now he possibly can, but this is a very good start. You know, so spend like one Sunday afternoon or Saturday afternoon with your kid, or you know, your nephew or niece for that sake, to get them rolling on this. Another program that we have done several times is a workshop. It's called as Alice. Alice, once again, um, is by MIT. Uh, so it goes to aliceprogramming.net. Um, it is primarily targeted towards girls uh, because it's a lot about storytelling. You know, girls are really good at storytelling. It's actually targeted at middle school girls. Um, so it's a 3D environment. You don't have to write too much code, but you can very easily get started. Go to aliceprogramming.net. It comes with an interface. You can download the interface, build your story around it. What does it teach? Well, it teaches a lot of concepts. Again, the <clears throat> education throughout the process is very subtle. It's not saying, it's not saying I'm going to teach you object-oriented concepts. The fact that there is a tree and you are going around the tree, 
That's the story you are building, and the background is creating those objects for you. So you learn those concepts, you know, how do you translate your ideas back into the code? You create stories, it comes with IDE, there is no syntax, and the best part, underneath everything is Java. People talk about Java as a verbose language, but I think that's the beauty of it. It's easy to read. How many people can read Clojure or Scala language? Ouch. A, a very good interaction model that is here in Alice is um, camera and world navigation. It gives you a different perspective. Oh, I'm looking at it from the right angle or the left angle or from the top or from the front angle. So it helps you visualize different perspectives. So depending upon where you want to be, what you want to be, is I think it's a beautiful tool, particularly for middle school girls. Now, not so much for boys. You know, I, I tried my boy to play with this. He's 13 now, but when I asked him to do this, the first thing that pushed him away is, Alice is a girl's name. I said, okay. So he didn't even touch it. But that's not the feedback generally I've seen. I've seen some boys using Alice as well. Green food is something um, um, which is, again, a fantastic tool. It really allows, it, it's, it's by University of Kent. So Michael Kohling is the guy who's behind the tool. Um, it can really allow you, see, I mean, if you think about it, Alice, Scratch, Green Food, all of these tools are very interactive. They give you that first level of satisfaction rather quickly. You know, Green Food is a, think of it as a gaming tool. I want to build a game. What am I going to use? I'm going to use Green Food. But the beauty over here is, here you get the full syntax of Java if you want to. So you can click on the tool and it will open up the Java code. You can start editing the Java code if you want to. If you don't want to, it gives you all that syntax highlighter, code coloring, um, auto completion. You can do that in a very easy way. So once you have done Scratch, you, know, you get the basic fundamental concepts going. Then you move to Greenfoot. That's sort of the transition path you can look at. Joy of code, which is sort of the third bullet here, is particularly very, very exciting. That's how my son started, like three summers back. You know, it's, a, it's about a 35 tutorials on YouTube. The link is here. Um, and in that link, basically, is 35 tutorials that helps you build a game you know, in a series of videos. 10-minute video, 15-minute video, just fantastic. You know, so if you want to start with green food, there is nothing better than joy of code that you want code going. Again, here, in terms of teaching, it's a 2D environment, first of all. But you have all the scratch concepts. In addition, lots of Java concepts, object-oriented concepts. Because as I said, anytime you click on a particular object, it opens up you know, your um, Java class behind it. Let me show you how does the interface look like. So on the left side, what you see is your interface look like. You want to do, um, I'm creating a new wombat, new leaf, and maybe a new cauliflower. And the objective of the game is the wombat or the bear, uh, the bear has to walk around and save itself from the leaves and eat the cauliflower, whatever the flower is. So that's your concept. That's the game that you need to build. And in order to do that, the bear has to make sure that it does not go into the squares where the leaf is. So that's, end of the day, you're writing Java code, but the way you are phrasing the problem is very different. Hey, you just want to build the game, make sure the bear does not go into the leaf square. And then you just, uh, and there are movements like turn left, turn right, go up, go down. You play around with those concepts, end of the day it generates it, and then you play, there's a bottom button on the green play button, you play, and it plays the game, and completely interactive. So rather quickly, you can actually get the concept and play around with it and see satisfaction. Now Blue Jay is a little bit higher, where okay, you've played with green food, you've so let's say you start with Scratch, you played with Green Food, now you want to play around with Blue Jay now, because Blue Jay allows you full Java code. You know, if you want to, um, there's actually a textbook and a teacher support where it's heavily used in school curriculums. Um, so it's like a full-blown Java IDE, you can write Java code. Of course, without the bloatness of Eclipse and tools like that, but it gives you the beauty and the lightweight nature. Very less number of buttons. Um, I'll get to the Eclipse part in a second, but one of the problems of Eclipse is, and we have used it in several workshops, kids tend to click you know, all over the places and they're lost. Oh, I lost my perspective. How do you explain them what a perspective is? So in that sense, Blue Jay is fantastic. Very minimalist IDE, very good tool to start with Java programming. Graphical cross structure helps them visualize how my classes are laid out. Uh, textual editing, you know, built-in editor. They understand the whole concept of 
what do you mean to make a jar file? Now, now, very minimal window, but fantastic tool to start with. Another tool, another workshop that we do all the time is Legos. You know, Legos is no longer just about static Legos. You know, uh, my son participated in FLL, which is first Lego League, um, and there are FLL leagues all around the world. I believe uh, there are in 160 countries now. But essentially, think of it as a Lego on steroids. Uh, it's a Lego brick, you can see on the bottom over there. It's about this big a brick. And now, well, this is, what I'm showing is NXT, which is the uh, NXT 2, which is older version of it with EV3. It's a Linux box. Uh, it's, a, it's a fully programmable Linux box. You can even burn Lehos on it. With Lehos, it's a Java operating system. You can actually write Java code on it. So essentially, in this, you know, there's a USB interface, there are all sorts of sensors, color sensor, uh, distance sensor, you know, um, RGB sensor, or ultralight sensor, all different sensors that you can attach to it. And then you can write all sorts of complex algorithms. I'm not sure how you do that. But effectively, um, all your scratch concepts are there. What you understand is robots are dumb. But once you tell them, they do the same task repeatedly very well. And so that's the main concept that we teach the kids with this, that they are in your control, at least today, not you are in their control. And here, you also understand how the sensor and event handling works. For example, one of the missions, when my, when my son was competing in FLL leagues, uh, there was an 8 by 4 board, 8 by 4 feet uh, field. In that field, there were lots of missions that they had to accomplish. One of the missions was build a robot. That robot is going to go out about two feet. And then there are four medicine bottles that are kept. Of the four, three are green, one is orange. And they could be kept in any order. The robot has to sense which one is the orange bottle, pick it up, and bring it back to the base. May sound simple, but required very complex engineering you know, in terms of how do you build the bot, because all you got is a brick and you've got a bunch of Legos around it. Because that's just one of the missions. There are lots of missions. The, the bot needs to climb stairs. The bot needs to open a certain thing. So how do you build a bot? How do you accomplish all those missions in a two and a half minutes? Another aspect of FLL which worked very well is, because there were about five kids in the team, so how do you hand off? You know, how many times in our projects, you know, there, there is no handoff. Oh, I checked in the code, it's, it should work. It works on my machine. And that's exactly the thing that they learned as part of this FLL league. Because end of the day, there are five kids. There's a four by eight feet board. In that board, there are lots of missions that everybody has to accomplish. Each kid is working on a mission. And end of the day, they need to consolidate that in one robot. That's what we do in real life, in our projects. How do you help them collaborate? So they learn that collaboration lesson early on, and I think that was a fantastic experience. It's like, no, 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 you overwrite my code. No, no, your code number is correct. And that's, yeah, he's just behaving like us. This is the bot on the bottom right that you see that they built for one of the leagues. Um, it's not very clearly visible, but on the top, on the top right here is the NXT. These are the wheels, these are the sensors over here, and that's the way they structured it. And on the, on the top over here, what you see is a user interface. This is completely drag and drop, so you can drag blocks, you can make logic in them, you can write logic in them. One of the most complex algorithms that the team built was line following. In the sense, you drop the bot on the field, and there is a black line which is going in a particular direction, write a code for that. They wrote a code on how the sensor will auto-calibrate itself and keep following the line in order to accomplish a mission. So there was a complex algorithm. They were working with a guy from Stanford who was guiding them how to do that auto-calibration. Some other workshops that we have done is Arduino, for example. You know, and with Arduino, again, the key part that we're trying to help them understand is Arduino is a very cheap board, $35, accessible very easily. But essentially, that's what grows up and makes a computer for you. And with Arduino, um, we have all sorts of uh, sensors, actuators. Uh, it comes with the Arduino IDE. You can write C, C++ code. You don't have to write you know, main function and stuff like that, because there's a wrapper around the C code that you write. So you write very basic code. 
Here, we teach very basic electronics as well. So how, do you, how does Ohm's law work? How does breadboard work? So our very first sample, for example, with Arduino is breadboard, turn a LED on and off. Just getting that to work is an accomplishment because you understand how does circuit need to work, what is the positive, what is the negative, all sorts of you know, issues come in there. Um, sensor handling, that you know, how do you make sure there's a heat sensor, how does that work, how do you read that value in your code and react upon it. Again, a lot of complex uh, designs, but kids drop them much faster actually. So here, for example, um, this is the Arduino IDE on the left. Now you write the code in there, and Arduino can do a single thing, just like containers, it can do a single command. So Arduino, well, you write the code in, in the laptop we're showing is Scratch for Arduino. So if you understand Scratch, there's a plugin available which is called a Scratch for Arduino. So you can write the code for Arduino in Scratch and you can upload the code in Arduino and then it'll run it. On the bottom, what you see, the blue part, is the native Arduino IDE. And end of the day, you're basically running the code. It just keeps running that one thing in loop forever. And you can say, okay, like keep sensing the signal and then act upon that. You can also understand the concept of functions a little bit with it as well. Minecraft modding. Uh, how many people know what Minecraft is? Yeah. And how many, uh, keep your hands up. And how many people you know who play Minecraft or are addicted to it? Pretty much, yeah. Minecraft is a 3D game. You know, it's a, um, it was built by Mojang um, three, four, five years ago. Um, it's a very crude looking game. And my sons first started playing with it. I was like, what has gone wrong with you, man? Why are you going with a blocky game? It's such a blocky game. There are no fine graphics. That's the joy of it. For our generation, think of it as an infinite bucket of Legos. You can build whatever you want. And once you have built it, once you have had fun, you blow it apart. You throw, throw some TNT and just blow the thing apart. Um, I'm not doing justice for explaining the game of Minecraft, but the joy of Minecraft is you can actually do, you can do the modification to the game. That's called as Minecraft modding. The game is written in Java, and the modification you can do is when you throw a TNT, it makes a circle of four blocks, explosion. The very first mod we do is, oh, let's make that explosion from four to 40 blocks. That's how we teach Java. The first code, Java code, that your kid has to write does not have to be public static white name. Gosh, no, it's gonna be hard to explain. What is the string, what, why am I making it public, why am I making it static? You know, you've already lost the kid's interest by that time. The first code that we make the kid write is, I'm gonna make your TNT explosion bigger. Ah, I love doing that. That's how you rope them in slowly. But effectively, when we do the Minecraft modding workshops, um, we teach them Java fundamentals, compiling, running, Eclipse, NetBeans, IntelliJ, all those tools. And we keep it really simple. And the best resource that we have used for over two and a half, three years now is minecraftmodding.org. Now, my son came to me, you know, he says, what, what, or almost three years back, he says, Dad, my jar is broken. I said, how do you know? And he was telling me that time. I said, what do you mean by jar? How do you know what a jar is? So no, this game Minecraft, I play the blocky game that you don't like, you know, that's written in Java, I said, okay, and that's a jar, and that is broken. I said, how, how come it's broken? I said, I hacked it. Oh, that's cool. So as a Java guy, I said, let me take a look at it. I helped him fix it. And then he told me, by the way, the game can be modified. And that really started the journey where we figured out how to do modding, and I like sharing things. So once we figured out how to do modding, we pulled his Minecraft buddies, we did a Minecraft modding workshop in our living room, literally in our living room with cables flowing around, pizzas and sodas. And that led us to co-author this book. So my son and I co-authored this book on Minecraft modding with Forge. It's an O'Reilly book, it's a QR code. Um, it's perfectly targeted at an eight or nine year old kid who has never programmed. You know, and a lot of times I've seen parents actually using this book to get into Java programming. That I'm gonna learn Java programming, as, and how I'm going to learn Java programming, I know how to play a little bit of Minecraft, and based upon that, I'm going to learn Java programming. Uh, I met a parent, you know, Microsoft invited us, now, well, Microsoft bought Mojang. Um, 50 people, maybe a little bit more. But they paid $2 billion to buy Mojang. 
And so Minecraft now belongs to Mojang, and I, we have a good relationship with my, Microsoft. They actually invited us to Minecon. Minecon is the biggest Minecraft conference in the world. So we were giving this workshop at Minecon this year in July. Beautiful. I mean, 10,000 kids. It's like a complete, you know, if you have seen Disneyland, it's 10x bigger. Kids go absolutely nuts. Now, in terms of some of our workshops, these are some of the workshops that we have done around the world. Um, that is Brazil. Uh, that is Switzerland. This is Poland. This is India. Uh, we did an underprivileged girls workshop at Intel in Bay Area. Oh. More pictures. Um, Let's see if I recall. Um, that is Indonesia, up on this Brazil, that's Belgium, that's Switzerland again, that's London in the middle. This is Bay Area. We did this workshop called as Paper Circuitry. This lady came up with papers, you know, and um, scotch tape and stuff like that. She built circuits on paper and beautiful, you know, you don't have to bring anything, and then you'll, you're lighting up circuits. Um, we have done these events at corporate events. So for example, these are two pictures from OSCON. The one on the top is from last year, the one on the bottom is from this year. So <clears throat> there were about 130 kids at OSCON this year, where we did the DevOps for Kids workshop. At Java One, which was a couple of weeks ago, we did a workshop for 450 kids. They were there, and we had about 12 workshops where kids were all engaged, and they were doing these workshops. So we did this workshop as part of Red Hat Summit, and more and more corporate events are looking at us. We are also doing these workshops in the US um, at different libraries. And a couple of weeks ago, we did at the Cupertino Library, San Jose Library. We, more and more parents are getting engaged where they're taking the material from us, and as part of the PTA meeting, Parent Teacher Association meeting, they are running these workshops as part of their school. Now, Home Depot is a store uh, in the US where you can go buy stuff like to build your house, anything. Plumber, electricity, name it, you know, wood, anything, nails, whatever you want to buy, you can buy it from there. And their logo is, you can do it, we can help. And the way I like to say it is, with DevOps for Kids, you can, kids can do it, DevOps for Kids can help. And that's sort of our belief. We want to change the fundamental way education is done, you know. Kids should not be deprived of technology because it's not available. So one thing we believe in, and I'll share the URL here with you guys. All our workshops are completely in open if the internet works. Okay, I've seen this weird trick work sometimes. You stop the network and you bring the Wi-Fi on, it hopefully renews the IP, and there you go. Yeah, it tends to time out. Okay, show me a good done sign here. Come on. There you go. Here you go. So all our workshops as part of DevOps for Kids, they're all publicly available. Um, GitHub.com slash DevOps for Kids slash materials. Then you, uh, you click on workshops. And you can see all the workshops are available over here. I'm going to increase the font size here. Now, whether it's Internet of Things, whether it's Flappy Bird, Greenfoot, Mindstorms, Minecraft, Now, name it. You know, all the workshops are available over here. So you're more than welcome to take the URL and share it with your friends. Once again, uh, github.com uh, slash devox for kids. And then in there, there is a materials directory. And that will give you all the workshops in that sense. So what can you do? You know, I think there are a lot of things that you can do. Well, we are always looking for new workshops. So if there is a technology, believe me, every technology should be teachable to kids. 
if there's a technology, whether it's JavaScript, whether it's Ruby, whether it's PHP, if you want to build a workshop for us, we are always looking for contributions. Now, we're a nonprofit, so, and we just want to share our passion with the kids. This is purely our weekend job and weekday evening job, and whatever time we have. So become an instructor. If there is a place where you want to run a local DevOps for kids chapter, absolutely, we're always looking for help. Send us a mail, info at devoxforkids.org, and we can help you getting, get, getting started with the chapter. Uh, we're always looking for sponsorship, so if you work for a company that is contributing to the community, we can always take sponsorship. We are a nonprofit registered organization, 501c3, lots of ways to contribute. I want to leave with a couple of inspirational quotes. You know, this is what Winston Churchill said. He says, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. We truly believe in the value of giving. We hope we are in inspiring some people and you know, creating some new lives. And then the last one that I love is, you know, the best way to predict the future is by creating it. So let's invest in our kids. Let's make sure our future is bright. Let's make sure we can keep sitting on the beanie bags and lazy boys and kids can keep doing all the work. That's our, those are all the resources. So devoxforkids.org is our main page. There's a USA chapter. There are lots of other global chapters, so you can look at that as well. The San Francisco Bay Area is one that I am very actively involved in. I drive that chapter. Um, you can open a new chapter, and there's lots of videos available on this Parley's channel. So these slides are all available um, in the same uh, materials directory I was talking about. So feel free to refer to them, share it, or you can always shoot me a mail, arungupta at gmail.com. Any questions? Send a mail to, the question is, how can we get involved with a local chapter? Send a mail to info at devoxforkids.org. You know, we are all on that alias, and we will connect you with a local chapter lead. We are always looking for help. And if you want to open a chapter, even then, same alias, info at devoxforkids.org. Let's say you, know, you figure out some of you guys are going to get together and open a chapter in your country or in your city. Sure. It's always an option. We keep the board very low. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> really, all you need is one workshop in a year. That's all we ask in order to be qualified as a chapter. You know, you, it's not a one-night stand that you, know, you do it and you're out the door. We want to at least keep up a yearly rhythm. So really, the workshop, the topic, the number of kids is completely up to you. And uh, I would start slow with a low number and just make sure I understand the logistics, what all is involved, and then scale it. That's how we started. Now, over two years now, we have, been, we have done about close to 60 workshops in two years, and we have about 1,500 plus parents as part of our meetup. So if I show you here, for example, if I go to the meetup page, this is the Bay Area meetup page, you can see there are 15, there are 1,534 parents. And this is a workshop that we just did uh, at the San Jose Library. All right, I guess that's it. Thank you.